So John 15, verses 1 through 13, ends Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. This is the word of God for us today. This Lenten season we have been going through and journeying through John. We've been reading through the Gospel of John to to see uh, how he lays out the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And this Sunday we've kind of jumped ahead a little bit. uh, And that's because John has quite a large section of about the kind of the last night that the disciples and Jesus have together. Uh, some scholars call this the farewell discourse. Uh, Jesus, as I said, was kind of teaching his disciples kind of the last things he wanted them to make sure they remember. Just, I mean, if, if you knew it was your last night with someone, you'd tell them the things that were most important, right? That's what Jesus was trying to do. He was saying, here's the things I want you not to forget uh, when I won't be with you, that these are the things you need to hold on to in order to live out the faith that I have called you to. And so the farewell discourse is chapters 13 through 17 uh, of the Gospel of John. And so we've jumped into that because... uh, Palm Sunday was before that and leading up to Holy Week. And on Holy Week, Palm Sunday, we're going to jump back to that uh, when we're together on that Sunday morning and then through Holy Week lead up to the the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So uh, we'll be in this farewell discourse for a couple of weeks and then we'll go back to that. Uh, But it's important for us to recognize these teachings that Jesus gives in that farewell discourse because they are so important. I mean, just those 13 verses, there's a lot in there. And honestly, uh, you know, I could preach for a couple of hours. Uh, If we have an extra hour, don't we, today? Maybe we could do that. Uh, oh, we had. Oh, we lost it. Uh, but there's so much in there that, uh, you know, I, I could, there's so much you could pull out, but I'm going to try and stay focused a little bit uh, here this morning on, on what we want to do. And it, I see in this passage Jesus calling us to be fruitful, that that's our purpose. We are to produce with purpose. Uh, we are to be fruitful as followers of Jesus. As Christians, uh, we are to be fruitful and, and to produce. And that's what Jesus calls us to. And so I want us to think about what does that mean then in each of our lives? How do we live that out if we're called to be fruitful? And the first thing I need to tell you all is that I am terrible at producing fruit. Uh, at least when you talk about real fruit and, and real vegetables. I, I don't have a green thumb. It might be more of a black thumb that kills things because um, I can kill house plants pretty easily. Uh, nothing lives in our house. There's no plants in our, alive in our house, are there? Yeah, there's not a living plant inside our house. Uh, and one time, Helen and I tried a garden. On the first house that we bought together, there was just this tiny little garden in the backyard that the, the people that owned it before us had uh, made. And we're like, well, let's try it. You know, we put some tomato plants in, uh, I think some carrots, maybe some other uh, vegetables. And we got a few tomatoes uh, from it because my mom helped with the tomato plants. Uh, but then all the rest of the vegetables, I'm pretty sure the rabbits of the neighborhood got more than we did. Uh, they just kept eating things and we couldn't protect it. And uh, so we gave up on that pretty quickly. Uh, so I don't have a green thumb. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't say be a gardener, right? He says God is the gardener. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And so that's the image that Jesus uses is reminding us to connect uh, to him and, and calls us to come into relationship with him. And this image of, of the vine is not a new one uh, as Jesus shares it. And we might think that this is a new image uh, that, that Jesus brings, but it's not. It's an image from the Old Testament. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel, the people of God, are called God's vine. Uh, they're thought of as God's vine, and again, God is still the gardener helping to raise that vine. And one of the images that is present in the Old Testament is that God took his vine out of Egypt 
and planted it firmly in the promised land in Israel in order to grow and produce fruit, to bring salvation to the world. That was, uh, in a sense, kind of God's plan, was to, to take that, pl- that vine and allow it to, to bring salvation to the world. And, of course, the image they're building on is that God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, took them to the promised land, then they were to live for God and to share God with the world and kind of be that salvation for the world uh, to be shared. But as you go through the Old Testament... That image of the vine, uh, which we see in Psalms, but also um, the prophets then kind of pick up on that image, uh, especially Ezekiel and Jeremiah, Isaiah. And what they do is they say, well, that vine that was God's vine began to become a wild vine. That vine began to produce wild grapes, they would say. Uh, That vine didn't do what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to produce fruit and be productive, but it began to go wild and go places that God hadn't intended. And so what God was saying is that, the prophets were saying, was that Israel was going the wrong way. They weren't doing what God had called them to do. And it's interesting when Jesus, the first thing Jesus said, he didn't just say, I am the vine in the first verse. What did he say? I am the true vine. And so in a sense, Jesus was saying, I'm coming to replace the vine that had been spoken of before. Jesus was going to now become the way uh, of salvation opposed to the people of God who had been the vine before. That God's plan now was to use Jesus as the vine that we were to connect to. And so um, before that, you would be connected to God because you were born into the people of Israel, right? Just because you were born a part of the family of God, uh, the people of God, then you had that connection to God. Jesus is saying, that's not necessarily the case anymore. You now have to connect to me, the true vine. And so it's a choice that you make. And the same is true for us as Christians, isn't it? We can be born into a Christian home, a Christian family, but that doesn't necessarily make us Christians. We have to choose to connect to Jesus in order to then truly become Christians and to live out the faith. And so the first thing that that Jesus is encouraging us to do here is to connect to the vine. We have to connect to the vine. We have to decide and, and choose to connect to Jesus and become a part of what Jesus is doing. Uh, that's where we have to start. It's not just natural. It doesn't just automatically happen in our lives. We have to make the decision, and we have to choose to connect to the vine. Uh, as I was thinking of an example of this, my first thought went to connecting uh, with electronics and things. Uh, our, I'm always connected. I don't know about you all. I always have my cell phone on me, you know, so that I can be connected to things. As soon as I walk into this building, my phone automatically connects to the Wi-Fi in this building. I mean, I just set it up to do that, to always connect there. But when I go out into public, and I go into different places where there is Wi-Fi, I have to decide whether to connect or not, you know? I have to push a few buttons. Uh, a lot of times they want to put your email in there, and then you can connect. And so if it was just free and you could always do that, I would probably do that. But I've connected to some places and given my email and then get all kinds of spam emails, and it slows down my computer. I'm always worried it might even just steal things from my, my computer or my phone, you know, just take information and use that uh, information. And so there's a cost to making a connection in, in Wi-Fi and, and all those electronic connections that we make. And in the same way, when we choose to connect to the vine, there's a cost to that. Um, there's some expectations that come when we connect to the vine. We aren't supposed to just go on being the same as we were before. There is a, a change that is supposed to take place uh, in our lives as we connect to the vine. And so that's what I want us to think about as we move to uh, kind of that next part. We've connected to the vine. The second thing that we have to do, and I wanted to stay with C words, and so I said cut it out uh, was the, the next step that we need to do. We need to cut out some of the things from our life when we decide to make that connection. There is some pruning that takes place. One of the interesting things as I was reading that, did you notice that every branch is going to get cut? Did you hear that? Every branch connected to the vine is going to get cut in some way. Some of them, the ones that don't produce fruit, they're going to get cut off and they're going to get thrown away. Uh, they're not going to stay connected to the vine. They're going to be cut off. But those that are connected and are producing fruit, they're going to be cut too, aren't they? They're going to be pruned. They're going to be neatened up. They're going to uh, get rid of some of the things that keep them from fully producing the fruit uh, that they were meant to do. And so for each and every one of us, as we decide to connect to the vine, uh, there's going to be some cutting that happens. There's going to be uh, some things that will be, need to be cut out of our lives because we are called to be different. Uh, in the scriptures, it often calls us to be holy as God is holy. And holy really just means set apart. You need to be different than the world and the culture that is around us. And so this morning, uh, I want to encourage you to, to be prayerful about the pruning that needs to take place in your life. Uh, I know that's a fun subject because everybody loves talking about pruning, right? And, and about cutting out the things in our lives that aren't pleasing to God. Um, and I like to stay on the positive side usually, so I don't often go there. Um, but there are things we need to prune in our lives, aren't there? There are things that we need to set aside, that we need to cut off, 
because it's not who God has called us to be. It's not a way that we can live with integrity and, and live out God's character. And, and that's what we are called to do. So I want you to prayerfully think about some of those things maybe that you might overlook, uh, that you do regularly, that, um, that God would want you to cut off. Uh, maybe it's, it's lying, cheating, stealing, gossip, uh, some things that we might, you know, just kind of make excuses why we do that or, or just overlook it a little bit because it's not really hurting too many people when we do things like that. Um, but things like that, God wants us to cut out, to set aside, to not do anymore. Um, and it's important for us to be mindful of those things. Uh, the words that we say are important. How we live our life is important as we are witnesses for Jesus Christ. And so maybe there's some things that, like those that you, that you need to cut out. Um, but then there's also some other things that I would say maybe are a little bit bigger, uh, a little more difficult to cut out sometimes because the culture uh, accepts them. Our society says, well, it's, no, it's okay to do those things. That's, that's just kind of normal. It's the way things are. Um, and, and when I think of those things, uh, it can be tough uh, to cut those things out. Foul language is becoming more and more popular, more and more common uh, to hear. And yet I think that that's not a great way to live with integrity, uh, to use language that is not glorifying to God. Uh, pornography is easier and easier to, to get your hands on and, and more and more common and, and overlooked. And, and yet I think that's definitely something God wants to cut out and, and get out of our lives. Uh, I think of violence uh, as something that we see in movies, video games. We see violence everywhere. It's, it's in our world, and, and sometimes we overlook it. Uh, but those are things we need to get rid of. We need to cut out uh, and let go of hate uh, at times seems to be growing. And, and that's not who God calls us to be, and we need to cut that out and get that out of our lives. Those are things that we don't like to talk about much. We like to say they're bad, but we don't want to say, how am I living in those things? How have I been connected to those things? And, and I believe those things harden our heart. They don't allow us to be who God has called us to be. And so we need to take serious some of those things. Uh, for me personally, uh, one of the things that God had me cut out when I was uh, young, and something I, I, that, again, is becoming common in our culture, is drinking alcohol. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't think alcohol is evil. I don't think people that drink alcohol are evil, okay? So don't hear me uh, say anything other than that. Th those things are not evil. I believe if you are 21 and you drink in moderation, that that's perfectly fine. Um, but for me growing up, I was, um, you know, became a Christian when I was 14, started working with young people and telling them about God's love. And especially when I became 21, I was still working with young people. I wanted to tell them, stay away from alcohol. I've seen it hurt people. I've seen it hurt families. Just stay away from it. And, and what I thought, well, but it's legal for me, so I can do it, right? But I felt like such a hypocrite if that was what I was going to do. If I was going to do it myself but tell them not to, I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. That's not what I think God's calling me to do. And so I decided at a young age, I'm not going to drink alcohol. And so I just didn't do it at all until I was 30. And when I became 30, I thought, now I'm like an old man, and I can go ahead and every <laughs> once in a while, uh, you know, I can do that. But I've, ne I've never had too much to drink. Uh, I've never done that. Uh, but until I threw it, that was the first time I, I had a drink of alcohol because I had decided that's something I need to cut out, something I need to prune uh, in order to be able to, to speak to young people with integrity and tell them they'll, you'll have just as much fun without that and, and you'll remember it. And so it'll be great. Um, you know, and so things like that, it wasn't easy. I got funny looks. I, I know there were some laughs at my expense, especially in college. Um, and at times, there was temptations to just, you know, be like everybody else. But it was something I felt God had said, you need to prune that. You need to set that aside and cut that out in your life. And so that was something God and I worked through. And so I want you to think about, maybe there's some things in your life that God wants you to work through. Maybe it's some things that everybody else around you is, is doing and, and is fine with doing, and, and that's okay. But maybe God's calling you to be different, to prune some things, to cut them out, to set them aside so that you can be fruitful uh, as he calls you to be fruitful. Uh, because when we cut some things out, even good things that we cut out uh, are done so that we can be the best, so that we can offer ourselves to the best things that God has for us. And, and that's really what it means to, to be fruitful, is to be chasing the best things that God has for us. And so what does that look like? We've said be fruitful, but we haven't decided what, is, what does being fruitful look like, right? Uh, maybe for some people I know, they say being fruitful means you have a lot of the Bible memorized, 
or you know the Bible very well. That, that's what fruitful looks like to some people. I don't think that's what Jesus said here is the most fruitful thing uh, that you can do. Um, some people think uh, to be fruitful, you have to be in a lot of small groups, you know, participate in several different small groups. Then you'll, you'll be fruitful. Jesus doesn't really say that here either. Uh, maybe being fruitful means going on lots of mission trips. Uh, and if you're trying to go on more mission trips than other people, then Roger Hall is your main competition. Uh, <laughs> This is maybe number 15 uh, for Roger, down, down to Haiti. And so, you know, you've got to catch up if that's what you're chasing. Again, I don't hear Jesus saying that's what you are to do to be fruitful. Now, uh, those might be things that God calls you to. I'm not saying those things are bad. Uh, but what, what does Jesus say here? To be fruitful, what he really wants you to do is to love. Love, that is the essential fruit of our faith. And so we need to decide to, to follow Jesus' command to love. We follow my command to love, Jesus says. That's what makes us fruitful in this world, is loving other people. And asking ourselves, what's the most loving thing I can do in this situation? And and maybe as you love others, uh, part of that love might lead you to learn God's word better, to to have God's word in your heart, uh, to memorize scripture. That might be something that God's love leads you to do. Maybe loving God means getting into a bunch of small groups. Maybe that is what love leads you to do. Maybe that love calls you to Haiti uh, 15 or more times. Uh, Whatever that love calls you to, that's what you need to do, but you have to do it because of the love that is leading you there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul lists a bunch of great things that we can do but he says they're meaningless without love. And so we need to allow love to be the thing that will guide us to be fruitful. Uh, And so we need to ask ourselves, what is the most loving thing I can do in this situation? And follow the command that Jesus gives us here, which is to love, to connect to him, prune off the things that are holding us back, and then fully love those who are around us. Uh, And I wanted to share with you, you know, somebody that I've seen that has been very fruitful. My first thought from this past couple of weeks was Billy Graham. He was fruitful, wasn't he? We could say that, and and he has died and and gone to heaven now. Um, But a man that just offered love to anybody that wanted to be connected to the vine. And uh, so you could be a Billy Graham if you want to. That'd be a good way to be fruitful. But I also think of, um, you know, we all can't be Billy Graham. But there was a great story you'll have to look up for yourself about the man that reached Billy Graham. That man didn't reach millions of people but he reached Billy Graham and offered love to him. And then Billy Graham was able to offer that other love. So we can be fruitful in many different ways. Uh, Personally, though, the most fruitful uh, person I think I've ever known uh, was a man named Stan Wierson. Uh, Stan was the founder of Summer Games, uh, which is a Christian camp, the one that I became a Christian at. Uh, He founded it back in 1980. And um, Stan would just, his, his passion, his love was reaching young people. That's what he wanted to do. And in 1980, God called him to do that through a, a camp called Summer Games, which was main focus was camping and sports. That was kind of the idea, was that we'd get kids to camp uh, because of they like camping and because they like sports, and then we would share Jesus with them. And if you talk to Stan, uh, I, I remember talking to him one time and just saying, well, what would you rather do besides camping and sports? And he would say, anything. I'd rather do anything than camping and sports. He hated camping and sports. He did not like those two things. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen him like actually camp. A lot of times he'd go to a hotel or someplace nice while we're all out in the woods, you know? Uh, and I've never seen him touch a football or a basketball or anything. He never even watched sports that I know of for entertainment. He did not like those things, but that was what God called him to. That's what God said, use those things to reach young people for Jesus. And I believe that was kind of Stan's pruning that he was willing to to be pruned enough to do something he didn't like because it meant he could love young people and he could reach them with the love of God. And and Stan did that very well. Uh, A lot of times he would reach out to um, star athletes or the the popular kids that uh, were the leaders of the pack, and he knows if he could share Jesus with them, then they would share Jesus with the other people. They would be fruitful. They'd be good branches uh, to connect to the vine. Uh, But then also Stan would love anybody, any young person. That's where he met me. Uh, because I was not a star athlete. I was not popular. I was not a leader. Uh, I was just a kid on the side, and I still believe I was just a favor for my mom. Uh, my mom, single mom raising three kids, I believe Stan said oh, she would do better with only two kids at home. And so I'll get that kid off to camp for the summer, and, and she would be, have a lot better summer uh, if he wasn't in her house. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how he invi- why he invited me to summer games. He never thought that I would get called into ministry, I don't think. But I think he was always open to the possibilities because you never know what the love of God will do when it gets a hold of someone. And so it was there that God then grafted me into the vine and I became a branch uh, because of the love that he had for anybody 
that was willing to listen, and he would share it with them. Uh, I want to encourage you to, to prayerfully consider how are you being fruitful? Are you producing what God calls you to produce, which is, is based mainly on the fruit of love? How are you loving the people that are around you? God has called you to do that as you connect to him uh, as the vine, and we are the branches. We are to spread his love to the world, to show them that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and that, that great love that he has offered to us. Uh, prayerfully think about how are you producing with purpose. Uh, allow God to prune some of the things that are holding you back, to set aside some things that might call into question your, your Christian character, your integrity, so that you can speak clearly the love that God has shown to you, to others. Jesus says, love as I have first loved you. And he said the greatest love is one that lays down their life for their friends. And Jesus lays down his life for us. And so we can lay down some of those things that, that maybe we enjoy, maybe they're good, um, maybe they're not good, but we can lay them down uh, in order to, to be more fruitful and to love others better that are around us. Uh, allow God to speak that to you this week. Uh, lift up that pruning that maybe he needs to do in your life. And then just, just be fruitful as you love each and every person you come into contact with. Let them know that they are loved, that they are cared for, because the God of grace and mercy uh, has seen them as his child and wants to connect them to the vine as well. Live in that love, uh, and God will be glorified. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you um, that, that you are the vine, and God, you are the gardener, and you help us to grow as the branches in this world. You have a purpose for us, and that, that is to produce fruit, to offer that love to all those who are around us. Help us, Lord, especially uh, to receive that love in ourselves. Uh, even when we make mistakes and we have those things that need to be pruned, let us not beat ourselves up, but let us live more fully in, into your love and your grace by setting those things aside, by cutting them off uh, and, and leaving them so that we can um, better produce for you, that we can better show love to those who are around us. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us eyes to see those that need your love especially those who might not feel loved, maybe those who are challenged to us to love. May you allow us to, to see that, that we have a calling, we have a, a command to love one another. May we lay aside our lives to live fully in the love you have given to us. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.